Hello, welcome to Go on the Run. And today we're going to be looking at streaming in gRPC. And so this is going to involve how you stream data from the client to the server and from the server to the client. And of course, if you can do those two types of stream, then you can do bi-directional streaming when you combine the two. So here's where I like to start today. Um, so if you go to the grpc.io webpage and you click on docs and then guides, and then you click on grpc concepts and you scroll down a little bit and we know this already, right? Service definition. And here we have what they call unary um, RPC, right? Remote procedure calls. And this is the ones that we're accustomed to where you pass in a parameter and it's synchronous, you get a response back. When that function return, when you make that API call, it returns a value. And it's just as if you call a function locally. Then this is server streaming. And so let's read it. It's a server streaming RPCs where the client sends a request to the server and get a stream to read a sequence of messages back. So in this example of streaming, if you look at the definition, all you do is you had the stream keyword before the message here in the return. And what you're saying is when the client makes this call, the server is going to send back multiple of these hello responses. And this is where the server is streaming. So it continues. The client reads from the return stream until there are no more messages. GRPC guarantees messages ordering within an individual RPC call. So that's nice. Then, of course, we have client streaming. And this is client streaming RPCs where the client writes a sequence of messages and send them to the server, again, using a provided stream. Once the client has finished writing the messages, it waits for the server to read them and return its response. Again, gRPC guarantees message, message ordering within an individual RPC call. And to express client streaming, you simply add the stream keyword before the client message, the client request message, which is what we know as the message, the input parameter to the, to the RPC that goes to the server. And then bidirectional streaming is just combining the two. And this is where you had the stream keyword on both for that one RPC on both the request message and the response message. And so here you can see bidirectional streaming RPCs where both sites sends a sequence of messages using a read write stream. The two streams operate independently. So client and server can read and write in whatever order they like. For example, the server could write, wait to receive all the client messages before writing it, its responses, or it could alternatively read a message, then write a message, or some other combination of reads and writes. The order of messaging within each stream is preserved. Again, like I said, the bidirectional case is just the combination of the two, and you can see that clearly expressed here. Okay, so this is what we're gonna be doing today, streaming. So let's see where we're gonna start. So remember, we're looking at gRPC and in our last video, we will look at part two, which is just how to do a service to begin with. Now we're gonna, and that was a unary service as we now know. Now we're looking at streaming services and this is part three. So if we go into our part three directory now, we don't have anything there, but in part two, we had an example that we finished with. So let's just copy our part two example four. So we copy exactly where we left off and we'll call it example one here in three. Okay, so I need to do minus R to means recursive copy. So now we have this as exercise one in our part three directory, but we are going to turn this into stream. Okay, so let's start up our Visual Studio Code editor here in part three directory. And let's go to our model. 
So here's our model. So what I figure we do to demonstrate streaming is we create a data service. So we're not going to modify our math service or existing service. Now really and truly we could start with something completely new and that would keep the clutter away. But I'm going to leave it there to show you that you can have multiple services register. Let's start off with service. Let's call it data server, right? That's what I'm going to call it. And what is our data server? The first um, RPC I want to do for a data server, I'm going to call it a random RPC, right? Which is our client. We're going to pretend that our client wants to get some random numbers from our data server. And our data server is going to generate a stream. This is server streaming, a stream of numbers and send it back to the client. So RPC, random, and we need um, the data request. Or let's just call it random request. Okay. Now remember what we want is a server stream and service. So returns. And so we want this to be a stream. So when the client sends makes a request, sends in one message, it should expect a stream of these messages back or a sequence of these messages back. So what we can now do is we can define our messages before our server or after, it doesn't really matter. So we can say message. And so what should we send to the server in order to get a stream of responses back? Well, the first thing I think we should do is say, how many random numbers do we want? So count, this is how many numbers do we want from the server random numbers. Now I'm using in 32 because I don't expect um, a client to request more than 4 billion numbers. So I think in 32 is good enough. Um, the next thing is it's possible that we might want to tell the server to restrict um, the random numbers between a certain range, right? We, we, we say the random numbers are bounded is what I'm going to say in between some range. So we should have like a Boolean that say whether this is bounded or not. Right. And so if bounded is set to true, what it says then is I want my random number to be no, um, to be at minimum this value and at most this value. No, we're going to see from the RAND API in Go that it tends to do something like from zero up. And so zero is always included. And even when you specify a upper limit, let's say you want random numbers no more than 10, for example, if you, in order to get number between zero and 10, you'd have to specify 11. So the number you specify is not included. So if like um, how you use when slices, when you want to slice um, an array, you the last number in it does is not a valid offset it's one pass it so we're going to use it the same way so um so this is going to be our min value so something like that right and so this is not really our max value value Max value is more like the upper limb, one past the upper or max value, really. Okay, but I can't come up with a better name, so forgive me if you could think of a better name, sure. All right, so 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 that's thing. So only when bounded is set to true, then these two other values are gonna be used. Otherwise, we'll just return whatever the random number, um, the rand function return, and those are usually just from zero up, okay? And we'll return a count of those many numbers. Okay. So now that we have our request, what does our response look like? Random response, since it's a sequence or a set of these messages, it's simply a random number. So all we need there is an in 64, and that's gonna be our value. That's it. All right, and so we can save um, changes here and it reformatted my protobuffer file. But now 
we can compile it. So let's go to our terminal and we'll go to exercise one. And if you remember our proto command, it looks like this. It's, and so if I put this here, for example, and if you just look on the side, you see that oh, when I run this, it's going to generate um, more data. That's because we have more things. Okay, so for now, um, what we can do is sort of just browse through our files to see what was created. But another easy way is to just look at this outline. And we can see it all we have um, data server, server, server. <laughs> I was this what I was trying to get away from. Um, actually, I wanted to, I should have called it data service, but whatever. Um, and then this is data server client. And um, then, you know what? I actually want, let's rename that. I don't like the data server server. In fact, I was going to get away from that. So let's call this data service. Okay, let's see. Let's regenerate this. I know that's petty, but oh well. I don't like that name. Okay, so data service server. All right, data service server and data service client. Okay, so those are the interfaces that it generated. And you can see for our data service client, we have just a random number and it looks just like what we had before where we have the input. And of course that should make sense, but our return is something else before our return would have been random um, data, um, random re response, but it's not just like we pass in random requests. If it wasn't streaming, if it was unary, we would get random response, but now we get in something else, which is this thing that we don't know. And we don't have to worry with it. You'll see in a minute. Um, this is all sort of implemented for us. And we just have to call this method that's been provided in this object. But we'll see how to use it. So why don't we do that? Instead of worrying about that, let's go over to the client. Let's start with the client. And we'll go here. And let's pull this down. And well, as a matter of fact, let me just close this for now. And so what we have is test mat service in which we pass in the client and we create a client which is new mat service client well since we're testing the mat service why don't we just put this within the test mat service function right that seems to make sense and the only thing we really need to pass in is this connection which is a grpc that client connection so we should pass that in instead and just do like this Okay, so I haven't really changed it much. Okay, the next thing is we want to create, let's create a function that tests our random service. So I will sort of, okay, let's write it from scratch. So let's do this function test data service random, right? And that's gonna, and we can say that oh we need the same connection right because we're gonna connect we're going to connect to a service on that same connection because our server is going to be providing both of those services the data service and the mat service so we're gonna say we take the same connection which is grpc that client connection okay great and so from here we should just simply call it so test data that and so there we go okay so what do we do here well we should create a client so the way we create a client is to say client that equals model that and if we do this and we do new you can see we have new mat service client or new data service client and this is what we want new data service client and it needs a connection. So we give it a connection. And what do we get back? We just get back this data service client. That's what we created in view of that. So we can see what we can do with this. Client that, and when we call that, what do we see? Is a random function. Looks just like before. So we call that function. What we need to give it is a context, CTX. Well, we know how to create a context. It's just ctx colon equals to context that background for example that seems to work fine enough and 
the other thing we have to give it is a model. Now we, in our part, previous example, we never use call options anyway. So we just need to give it a random request input. So let's do in colon is equals to ampersand model that random request. And we populate this guy. And so what do we have in here to populate? Well, I would say let's start off with something simple and just say, what about if we request 10 random numbers? And so, so far, no, nothing is different than what we did previously. We just simply call in a method that's on an object. So let's see what this function returns. This function returns something called data service underscore random client and error. So this is the stream on which we should expect to be able to keep reading data from the server, those random numbers and an error. So let's do that. So, and now that we have the stream, we can check for an error. We can say if error, right, that equals to nil, what do we want to do? We want to log fatal, for example. All right, if that did not fail and we're successful, it does not null, then what should we do now? Well, we should definitely try and start streaming some data back. Well, remember when we looked at it just now, when we looked at, where was that thing? Um, this guy. When we looked at that client's data thing, this guy right here, we saw that oh, there is this method, receive. And it's the receive method that returns our response, our random response, which is the thing that we want. So, and we learn from the documentation that once the server is streaming, what the client should do is keep looping and reading those sequence of messages. So let's take a look. So we do stream dot, and there are a few other messages, methods here, but we only care about receive because this is the one that returns our model, that random number. All the other one, header, context, and close send, we don't care about. Those are for more low level use by um, gRPC itself. So um, we'll see later, not in this part, but in maybe some future part, maybe we'll find some uses for them. So what does this return? This returns the response we want. Let me keep this here. The response and an error. So we have our result, which I'm gonna call V for now, and error. So let's do it like this. And so I would say, so long as the error is equal to nil, basically there's no error, then we can say that, oh, let's print out V. And so we can say, um, oh, you know what we should do? We should print out how many random numbers. So we should say um, var i um, is int. And so, or rather, let's do i colon equals to one. Let's start at a one. So we can do percent two v dot, and then let's say, let's put the random number. Okay, nothing fancy. And so, come on. And we do i and v dot value because that's what we're going to get back then we do i plus plus now this is pretty simple we have a stream we receive a, um, a random number we check and see if there's an error we print it out if there's no error we print it out and then what we should do is receive another value so we can do vrr well v comma err rather equals to stream that receive try to receive yet another value and if there's no error when we try to read again this loop is just going to print out that value and then keep going if there's an error it's going to stop and once it's stopped then we can print out check and see what kind of error it is now do we really care at that point well maybe if it's and 
I'll end the file, that means that oh, there's nothing more to read and that's fine. If it's anything else, then that could be a problem. So first of all, let's do this. Um, let's do, let's do FM, fmt.printf. Let's do that. And let's do error is, you know, percent V. And then let's do ERR just to see what is the error when this stop looping. Okay, so that's our client. I don't think it's very different from what we did before. The only difference here is we would have made a call here and we've gotten back our one value that we want or a random response. Now we get back a stream instead when we call this function and we simply loop on that stream calling the receive function. That's it. Not much so that you, you can get streaming. Okay. All right. So of course, if we were to run our client code now, it wouldn't work um, because we didn't implement the server. So let's go to our server. In this example, now we can move a little bit faster. And so if you remember what we did here, when we were implementing a server, we created a struct to implement the server. So we'll do the same thing here. We'll create a new file and we'll call it data service. That go. And let me paste just this only. And so I'll call this my data service because that's what we're going to be implementing. And so how do we do it? Well, let's see what we have to implement. If I go back to this and let me do this and keep it open. And I look at the data. So this is an interface, the data service server. Where is that data service server? So data service server, this guy, this is what I need to implement. This thing take the random request and it's, it is provided with a um, data server, data service, random server. So we'll use that somehow to stream data back to or responses back to the client. We don't need to worry about it, but let's just know that though this is the API. You see, it says here data service server is the server API for the data service service. And so let's do that. Let's go funk. Let's do M star and then do my data service. And the function I need to implement is this guy. So let's return nil by default. When we get to the bottom there, there's no error. And here we'll just call this in and we'll say this is from the model package. And we'll call this out because that's how we're gonna send things out. And this is from model also. Okay, let me just close my screen, close this side here so you can see everything. I'm not doing anything really strange other than to say, so let's save this. Other than to say that we have in as a parameter and out here, if you remember, out that model that this, this is just a, um, a an interface. Now, why, oh, this is, I don't have anything that's being imported. So let's fix that. So import, I don't know why my imports are not, let's see, save, why my imports are not working. So save model the da, da, out model yeah i'm not sure why this is no longer working so let's do this i want to import i want these same imports there we go data service so i want these and Right now, I'm not, I'm not using context anywhere, so there's no point in having context, and I'm not using FMT, so take that out. Okay, so there we go. All right. So let's see how we use this. So previously, we did some tests. We said if, for example, if M is equals to nil, then you know we're gonna return an error message. Uh, we can copy that essentially from uh, our mat service here. We did these sort of tests to make sure that oh, we are actually dealing with valid parameters. So for example, 
um, if m is equals to nil, then we return. So it's just one error. So we don't need to return two va one value to return. So that's it. Um, so we said, you know, random called on nil object. So that's that. And then if n is equals to nil, then we can say, you know, random call with invalid value nil. So that still stands. We can check that. Now is where we get into the work. So at this point, we know that our n is not nil. So we need to stream or send back a certain number of um, responses. So how many responses do we need to send back? Count responses. So we have count colon is equals to in that. And if you remember, this is count. But count here is an in 32 value. So well, you'll see why I am casting this to int in a second. But the reason why is because I want to use the for loop and the for loop in Go uses int instead of unsigned int or anything funny. So I say for i colon equals to zero, i is less than count i plus plus. And so now we're set up to loop for whatever is specified in count. What do we do within the loop? Well, we need a random value. So how do we do it? I want to be able to do something like this. V colon is equals to um, R that, and then call the int um, 63 function. Well, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Let me show you what I mean. So if I do var and I create a new random number generator, so now my random number generator is called R. So from R, if you do R dot, you will see all the different number type of random numbers you can create. You can fortify numbers, int, int 32, and so on. And if you look at this int 31n, this is what I'm talking about where you specify a value and it returns from zero up to that one minus n. But we're looking at in 32, in 64, 63, because this returns an in 64 bit value, which is exactly what we need for our, um, and notice why it says in 63, is because the random number is non-negative and it goes up to 63 bit int, okay? And so now we have a random number, we can then put it in send it, right? So we can do out that and there again you see the number of methods and properties but the only one that seems interesting to us is send why because send accept a parameter called model that random response and that's exactly what we want so we want to do model that random response and we want to send a value which is the only thing that matters to us and this is v Right, makes sense. And so that's all there is to it. We just sit in a loop, send the number of requested seek numbers. And then once we're finished, and since we're not returning an error, this tells gRPC that we have finished streaming values to the client. And it will signal the client, let's go back to the client code. It will signal to the client that, oh, by the way, there are no more values. And so the client will then exit. It's going to get some sort of error and exit this for a loop, which was reading values. And then we'll see what that error message is. And that's all there is to it. All right. So let's go run our code. So go back here. And so if we look, we have this. I'll open up two shells. And so let's clear up here. I'm going to go, call, go into the server directory. I'm going to say go build to build our server. And then I'll run the server. It's gonna be sitting there waiting. And then I'll go into the client directory, go build, then run the client. And there we go. Huh, problem, see? Unimplemented descriptor, unknown service model that data service. Well, what is the problem? That's control C. We implemented our server or data service but we never registered it. So let me close, close some of these things. 
So what we need to do in our server, now that we've implemented here, is need to register it here. And if you remember, the way we do this is very simple. We create a new gRPC server, which is server, and then we call model that register my mat service, and then we give it the service that we want to register. Same thing, we do model that register, and now you can see we can register two services. And so the only one left to register is our data server. And so it's gRPC server, use the same server, and my data service implementation, right? That's it. And so now we go back and we build our server. Let me clean up and then we run it. It's in there waiting. And now when we run our client, notice. It works just as before. So all our math and everything work because we look, we've registered multiple server services on that one gRPC server. And we also now have our random number generator. And notice how we requested 10 random numbers. We got back 10 random numbers. And our error here is an EOF. So this really shouldn't be printed out as an error for a client. This should be a nice, clean, meaning the end of file. So like if you're reading data from a file, when you get EOF, that's not really an error. It's just telling you, yeah, we reached the end of a file. So what we want to say now is, if ERR not equals to IO.EOF, so if it's not equals to this, only then is it an error. And then we should print it out. Otherwise, it'll, everything is fine. All right? Error reading data from reading stream, random stream or something like that. Okay? So that's all there is. And so we can compile recompile our client and as it go build then run it again and there you go no error message because that is expected okay so we finish our unidirectional streaming which is server streaming the server streaming data to the client so let's close this and let's copy our example so in this example what we want to do is so in example two, what we want to do is do a little bit of cleaning up on our client because as it is, our client hard codes how many random numbers we send to the server. Um, we can do better than that. Why don't we pass those value in as parameters? So for example, some of the things we can do, and I'm going to speed up type in here. So um, it's nothing fancy. It's just adding some more flags. Just like we have a flag for a server, we can add a flag for the count of how many numbers we want to send to the server. We're going to add that Boolean for whether the, it's bounded. And then we're going to add two more um, flags for the lower and upper limit for the random number. So let me just type that real quick. OK, so after typing that up, so basically what I have is a I added a flag C to represent the count of random numbers we want to send. B to represent um, whether it's bounded or not, and min and max. The only thing I should probably add to this is that um, if B um, is true, then uh, min and max must be specified. Specified, right? Um, because if we're saying it's always going to be bounded and we don't specify min or max, then by default, these values are zero. And we can easily check that. After we finish parsing, before we do anything, like you know any dial option or anything, we should see if our program was provided with the correct parameter. So we could say if um, bounded, right? Basically, if it's bounded. OK, so now that we have that, um, there's another thing we can do too. We can check and make sure that our count is not negative. We can have the user specify minus 10 um, random value either. So we can check that any place. Um, I'll do that first. So if count is less than 1, it's negative. Um, if it's 0, well, why send and ask for no, essentially no random value? So uh, we don't want to make that API call in that case. So if it's less than 1, then we can also say log fatal. 
count must be greater than zero. Zero, something like that. All right. So that's all our error check-in. And this is before we run our program or we do anything. Okay, at this point, we know that everything is fine. And so now we just have to come back to this part. Now remember, if we're going to get count from the user, then we have to put count here, right? Because this is what we're going to send. And let's see here. So we use int var, and that's because flag doesn't have int 32. It has int var, uint, and int 64. But our count is is an int 32 value. So we just have to simply cast this to int 32, and we're fine. The other thing is, that for a random request, we can also specify whether it's bounded. So we can just pass bounded, whatever the user pass into the program or whatever the default is, that's good. Now, the other thing is we know that our, um, the min and max value, so min value, this is min value, and let's do max value and that's max value um, what if we do it like that would it put it in a new line uh, so it is way too spread out for me so i'll do this i'll break up the lines because it's easier to read this way instead of it running off the screen i'm typing way too slow so there's there all right so so nothing else changed we just sent it off and we wait for the good news to come back. So let's see if we, we haven't changed our server yet. So let's kill this. Let's go back up, go into exercise two directory and exercise two server. And we'll do go build. Let's clean up and let's run our server. And we've changed our client. So let's go back up and we're going to Exercise two and client, and we go Google build. And if we run our client, we should see that we have some extra parameters. And so by default, it's going to use 10. And so we see that how that still works. And if we do minus C five, for example, that works. Minus C 20, that works. What about minus C a thousand? It should definitely work, 10,000 should totally work right so we've now uh, made something where we can request how many random numbers we want and maybe you can find a better way of formatting this but that's what it is okay so the only thing left is for us to specify bounding so if we say oh this is bounded and what it is you can see it all over check works and so we can say minus min value is let's say five minus max value is let's say 20 and so this doesn't seem to work why because our server wasn't implemented to um, handle that case so let's go here and so our data service let's go down and so what do we want to do um, so what we should do is we should say um, oh yeah yeah let's do that var v is int 64 so and the reason why I want to do that is because I want to be able to say if in that um, is bounded. Now, somebody who is looking at this, I'm going to write it a simple way and then I'm going to rewrite it. I'm going to say if in is bounded, um, then we should do something special. Else, we should just do what we were doing before. So let's read that again. So if it's not a bound, if it's not bounded, just simply get a random number. But if it's bounded, then we need to make sure that our random number falls within a certain range. So if we do, and there's some calculations we can do by just simply reading the random number we have and doing like a modulus and all this other stuff, but no point in doing that. All this is provided for us already by our random number um, module. So if we go to N64 or we go to N and we, over here, over the here, we'll see it says return as an N64 a non-negative pseudo-random number 
in the range starting from zero, this square bracket means zero is included, and n, whatever n is specified, but this curve means, this parentheses mean that our n is not included. So that's one less than n. And it's also tells you that it panics if n is less than zero, which we take care of you know, on our client side. So really, if you think about it, since int 64n, 63n returns something from zero to n, what we really want, and since we have a minimum value and a maximum value, is we want the difference between min and max, that's the range of value that we want int n63 to pr provide, and then we can offset that result. So that's pretty easy to do. We can do this part returns from zero to whatever range we give it here. And so we wanna offset that by adding back our minimum value so that we never return a value less than our min. And so now I want to store that in V like this. Okay. And so now if we run this code, but the only thing is here, we're going to be doing this for loop and we're going to be checking if in, uh, if we are bounded, this means for every time we go along this loop, we have to check if we're bounded, but we know that though for each call is either we're bounded or we're not bounded. And so, but let's just check and see if this works, and then we could come back and improve that. Um, it's not a very big deal, but somebody might look at it and go, hey, you're checking, you're calling the if statement that never check changes every time you go around the loop. So let's just make sure that at least this works. And let's rerun this. And there we go. As you can see, that it works. We have limited our values between five, and we shouldn't have anything lower than five. Five is allowed to be there, because remember, our minimum value is five. And the way this works is that we can get five. It's just that we can never get 20. Okay, and there we go, we have five there, but we can never get 20, we can only get up to 19. So this certainly works. Um, but what we might wanna do to make this a little bit more performant is to do something like this and say, um, just pull this out and say, the only difference is that we pull out the for, the if test diary, and we test once, and then we go into a loop. Whereas before we were going around the loop, which we have to do, and then we we're testing if bounded, but if bounded would not change once you call this function. So let's control C, let's build, let's rerun it. And now let's run our client and notice it still works. All right. So now the last thing I want to do is show you how to do streaming from the client to the server. So for that, let's close this, copy it. All right, so let's clean up, clean up. All right, so maybe we can close this for now. Okay, so what are we doing? Let's make sure we edit in the right file. So in exercise three, what we want to do is start with our model. And here we only have one RPC and that is for server streaming. We want to do one for client streaming. So I would suggest let's do something like an RPC where the client sends a number of values to the server and have the server sum those value up. Very simple, right? So the server have to wait, get a number of requests from the client, and then able to compute a response. So let's call it sum, and let's call it sum request. Very creative, right? Returns, again, sum response. And for this, we wanna do client side streaming, so this is going to be a stream. And just as before, we'll write our messages before below. So we inside message and we say some request. And in terms of since the client is streaming to the server, it's sending the same thing. So we just simply want to send in 64 bit value. That's it. We just want to send in 64 bit value, a stream of them to the server. And the server is going to sum those up and it's going to respond with the result so message some response and in 64-bit value and the result or the sum 
right? Whatever you want to call it, total. We can call it total. Equals one, right? Not very fancy. So now that we have this, let's go back, open up our terminal, and let's rerun. So let's go back up one directory, and we have the model here, and we will run protobuf. Okay, that works. So we go back in the server directory. And so if we go here and we look at our types, but some server and some client. So there we go. Where is it? Some client. And you can see some client has a send method and a close and receive. Again, seem, seems pretty straightforward from the client side. We'll just do keep doing send, 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 send these request messages, which is all the numbers we want the server to sum up. And then at the end, when we're finished, we'll just simply call close and receive, which will should return us the response that we expect from the server. So very straightforward from the client's point of view. Let's go back to the client code. And this time I want to write a new function, which I'll call function test data service sum all right so now we have context now we have a new client can a new client here and so what we can do is say client dot and this time we're using the sum api we have ctx for our context we don't need any call options so we save and then now if we look at what's returned it returns data service underscore some client and an error. So that data service we know is the stream, is the thing that's gonna allow us to stream data to the backend from the client. And so error, so let's put that in, and then let's get our error handling code. So this is basically this guy. We're saying if you cannot, for whatever reason, Right. If there's an error when you try to do the sum call, we just print that out. Well, what is this stream? Stream that we saw just now. It had this close and receive, and then it had this send. So it seems like we should be sitting in a loop, sending some value. How many how many values should we be sending? Hmm. You know what? I'll reuse the same count that we pass in and use that for sending. All right, so now we want to do stream.send and we just simply need to find input now. So in, so in colon equals ampersign model that sum request. And if you remember, we only have one thing that we have to send here. And so why don't we just create some random values and send it? But we know how to create random values. That is super, super easy. We go up here. And we say source is equals to time that uh, ran that new source time that no, and then get the Unix value for that. Save it. And then let's do R is equals to ran that new and give it this source. Save that. And we come back down to the bottom here. And so all we need to do is send r that int 63. Um, r that int 63. Why is that not? Oh, and let's use this one so we can limit our value within a certain range. Let's say 50. And so now I save this. So now I'm um, just getting some random number to send and I'm getting count of them. I send them over the stream. Once I finish sending, that's right, I finish my for loop. The only thing I need to do now is this stream that close and receive. No parameter. It simply returns our result that we expect and an error. So it returns, let's say, result. Um, so result and an error. And just as before, if there's a problem, I'll just copy this down below. Then we can say that our oh, data stream that some RPC failed, you know, and print out that value. Otherwise, we can just say fmt.print f, 
and we can say total uh, total plus nv new line and then we can say result that result this is uh, not rest result that and total and there we go so now the only thing left to do is we should see which random number we're sending so i would say let's do v colon equals and let's just stick this up there let's stick v here and then we can say fmt.print f and then we can say percent v uh, maybe I, sh I should format this better uh, let's do something like that and value or sending percent v new line and i want to send v so there we go uh, command all right so that's it um, let's review real quick so for this we have oh we have to test it so test some service and so connection and all we do is we create a new client we call the some rpc using context we get back a stream on which we're going to be able to send multiple values to the server and so fmt printf um where is the problem percent v uh, there we go and then i need i okay and so we send these values to the server using stream that's in we just simply make in the values here constructed values and we send it and once we finish in this for loop the way we signal to the server that we finish sending is by calling this function close and send and this function you can imagine do, do two things it tells the server hey no more values stop listening uh, receiving and now you can it's your turn to compute and send back the result and then it blocks and waits until the server is finished doing its computation and it returns us that response okay so from the client side this is all good now let's close this and let's look at the server side so from the server side we're doing still doing data service right remember our rpc is part of data service so let's go take a look at what we need to implement so we need to implement data service server so this guy right remember it says this is the api for the data service api and we just need to implement this function now nothing changed about our previous function so let's go implement this so we go here and i will put it on top here by simply saying function m times my data service and then i paste this this is the thing I need to implement. I'm going to return nil for now. And this is from model. So I'm going to call this in star model. Well, I don't need to call it star because it's just an interface. So it's not an object. And we can see that from here, interface. OK, so this is the thing that's coming in. And so what do we need to do? This is a server now receiving a stream from the client. So let's just do. Uh, we can do tests to make sure that oh you know we're not being called on um, you know on a nil object or something like this but you know that is all just fluff that you can put in or not really fluff but important stuff but anyway this is not production code so that's my point um and so we can do in that and if we do in that what do we have we have context we don't care about that we have receive and receive return us um, some requests. This is exactly what we want. We want some requests and it just simply returns, let's over over it and see, it receives some requests and an error. So it seems to me that we should be um, accumulating our values. So if we have var total is um, int 64, and then we can do for i colon 12, not really what we can do is say the value we get from our request and the error right and then we can do what we did before we can say for 
error equals to nil. If it's equals to nil, then we can say total plus equal is equals to v that value. So we just simply get the value from the client and accumulate it. That's what we're supposed to be doing, calculating the total. And then once we do this, we can again call in that receive, right? To receive another message and then we'll loop around, right? So we'll loop around if this is this receiving is not an error, then we go back here. Now, just as before, if we get io.error, it just simply means the client has nothing else to send. So if the error, when we finish, if we break out to this loop and the error is not equals to io.end of file, only then is it a problem. Otherwise, it is not a problem. So we can do that, paste that in there. So uh, we can return at this point if we like, but this error message, right? We can say some error on nil version. We can say um, unexpected error or something. Assembly, and then we can return that error to the client to see what kind of error it is. Otherwise, so that if the error is EOF, no problem. What we need to do then is just say in that send and close, right? On the client side, it says close and receive, which would signal to us that we have nothing else to receive. Now we could say send and close, and this is what allows us to send back our response. And our response is just going to be model dot sum response and the total, right? There's a field here called total. If we do load, and it allows us to return the total that we computed. And that's it from the server side. Again, all of it from the server side for this API that streams from the client fits here. Just sit in the loop, receive the message from the client. Not that hard. And when you finish, say send and close. And so now we should be in the exercise three directory, which is what we're doing. And we say go build. And then we do server, run the server. And then on the client side, we confirm that how we're in the client directory and we say go build. And then we client. And then as you can see, we're sending 10 values. Now our default of 10, we send 10, got 10 random numbers, and we can still limit it. So we can still say bounded, and then minus min is five, um, minus max is you know 25 or whatever. And so that affects the the range of the random number, but notice we still send in 10 and this is the sum of it. And so let's do something that's probably easier for us to calculate. So let's do three. And so we got three random numbers from the server and we could put better outputs here. And we say send in 21, send in two and send in 15. So that tells me that always 21 plus two is 23 plus 15, 10 is 30 and then five is 38. I'm not going to do another example that combines the two ID because I think once you understand what we did in exercise one and two streaming from the server and in exercise three, we did streaming from the client, just combine the two and you can do the exact same thing. But you're going to see it's pretty obvious what you need to call from the API that is generated and you have to implement. Um, so that's it. I hope you found this um, pretty clear to follow. Let me know if you had some problems with it and then I'll probably redo it or something like that or try to fill in the gaps. But I think it was sort of clear. All right. Um, I want to make a note that um, the video is going to be in order to try and put out videos more frequently. I'm going to be spending less time editing the videos. So you're going to notice probably a lot of mistake or things um, redoing things. That's because I'm not going to spend so much time trying to edit it. That's because I want to be able to push out more videos 
Um, but the quality, the content I'm going to be covering is still going to be the same. It's just a matter of me not trying to cut out too many mistakes. I'll still speed up things where it makes sense to speed it up. But other than that, expect to see me repeat or correct my mistake in the videos and those not be edited out. Okay. If you haven't subscribed already, subscribe. If you haven't hit the notification bell, hit that so you can know when the videos are posted. And please spread the word. If you like what you see um, in the videos, definitely spread the word and, you know, give thumbs up and so on. All those things help. Um, and definitely if you see some ads and you can watch it and stand the time to watch it, that also helps. Um, it's not anything right now. It's literally pennies, but you know, who knows? Maybe one day we'll get there and I can do this full time. Take care. See you. Bye.